So welcome to Jan Artem Henriksen, who is the executive director of the Inner Development Goals Initiative. And he's also the co-founder of Self Leaders Relate and Mind Shift. And Jan and I have known each other for a while and uh, bumped into each other in many, many different arenas of work. And uh, I really respect the journey that Jan has been on. So Jan, would you like to describe for our viewers who are meeting you for the first time, just introduce yourself, you know, who are you? What makes you, you basically? <laughs> uh, thank you, Indra. Thanks for having me here. Um, I'm deeply passionate about personal development and inner growth. And my passion, I think, comes both from a personal confusion. I find it hard to navigate the world. And the older I get, the harder it gets, the more choices I see. Mm. But also growing up in a divide between different stories, different values. I'm, I'm from Ukraine. I have family both in Ukraine and Russia today. And growing up in Sweden, which is one of the most maybe soft and feminine cultures kind of that hasn't had so much trauma from the war mm. uh, and Ukraine and Russia, maybe on the other side of it, very strong masculine heroic values and quite a lot of trauma and just trying to keep the relationships to the people that I love, my, my brothers who are still there, my father who is there, my mother who is here in Sweden and trying to navigate that divide has made it necessary, I think, for me to, to interest myself around personal development and human growth. So that's my path into it. And then I studied some philosophy and psychology and leadership and been teaching leadership at Stockholm School of Economics and then working with uh, bringing out uh, the, the knowledge, both psychological and from the leadership side uh, mm -hmm. to the business world. And uh, now more and more, globally with the inner development goals to governments and to big organizations. Wow, I mean, you've, 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 you've sketched out a huge terrain. And, you know, for the sake of our um, listeners, I'm going to try to go back into that a little bit and take it a little bit step by step. But, but maybe immediately, you know, it's very, it's very, uh, you know, it's poignant and it's so... Um, important you know the journey that you are describing now because you're holding so many different worlds within you mm -hmm. um, and there's not many people who we would be able to ask directly you know what is this relationship that we're seeing erupt on the world stage now between Ukraine and Russia and how we should view that from different parts of the world and before we go any further I, I just want to invite you to to give any clues to what this moment is for you um, and through that lens we'll be able to go back a little bit into the into the other things that you've been doing i mean it's so polarized and loaded those questions and and even still for me hard to navigate i mean there is i have family members who haven't spoken for years because of very different views on this mm. uh, and I think of course it's 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 horrible what's happening and my heart is with the Ukrainian people uh, for this uh, there is if to say something new there are there are perspectives where Russia has since the second world war not feel seen maybe in the big sacrifice that they have done and been trying to fight their way to respect uh, for that. And there is a lot of trauma and suffering there. And um, maybe Europe not taking the possibility to include uh, Russia in that. It doesn't in any way uh, defend what's happening. But And then also, of course, the traditional values versus the progressive values. And we see this polarization in many parts of the world. Uh, and the question is, how can we hold that? How can we hold those more conservative parts of ourselves and of our societies? And how can we, at the same time, uh, embrace the development and progressive values 
that are coming up and how can we stay in touch with both parts in ourselves, in our countries, uh, in our families. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll be that mystical in my response and just uh, stop there so we can actually get into the human development aspects of it, because I do think that human development broadly is the capacity to, to hold and to see uh, more perspectives and to be able to navigate hopefully in a more wiser and compassionate way. Uh, so, and it feels more important now than ever, I think. Yeah, and thank you so much for responding and being willing to respond because I so resonate with the truth that anything can be polarized so easily by the public space and in the public space, in the world of the media. Um, but to be able to land something which is true for you um, and then go immediately into the capacities that we need now. And just to feed back to you in terms of the bigger project that we're doing here, you know, that in a sense, our political reality or the political structures that we have until now seem to be themselves, you know, polarized. They go from left to right, they go from in to out or right and wrong, you know, good and bad. And you know, if the task really, or the goal of the work that you're doing, that we're going to try to explore a little bit more here is to be able to hold those things and wisely navigate them, as you say. Um, it seems a very noble goal for something that might be called politics in the future. So let's try to get a bit deeper into that. So could you, Jan, describe your own development, you know, in terms of where you started with this work, going back to the first, you know, companies that you start, you know, that you founded yourself and take us a little bit through your progression and what you feel necessitated moving from one to the other, if you see. Sure, sure. So yeah. I, I, I did, I studied, as I said, quite, quite some psychology. Uh, before doing uh, my master at Stockholm School of Economics, where I discovered that a lot of the people doing leadership trainings uh, do not go deep into psychology, into attachment theory, motivational psychology, or adult okay. development, uh, because there is much more, I mean, power-based view on leadership and organizational view, so to say, but they sometimes lose the individual. Um, so... I started teaching at the Stockholm School of Economics together with my friends and colleagues, Dick and Dominic von Martens. We started a course in self-leadership uh, for students to start with, but then it went both on the MBA program and became quite popular at the school where we worked with very personal tools and ways of relating to the world through your personal values, through clarifying your vision, through understanding your personality and traits, but also seeing the cultural context that you're embedded in. Mm. I mean, uh, how, how is that different uh, from wh wherever you are? Um, and also get, getting some strategies for being self-authoring and creating the life that you want to live uh, or contribute to the purposes that are dear to your heart. Uh, and from that, we created the first company named Self Feeders that has educated 80,000 plus people, which is about 5% plus of the academics. So people with, there, we've been working a lot uh, with big organizations like Ericsson, Spotify, Atelier mm -hmm. in Sweden. Uh, and that has been really important and good fun uh, to work with that and to, to contribute there. But also I realized after a while, after 10 years actually, that I was contributing to people who were already quite well functioning mm -hmm. and in some sense homogeneous. The managers in the Nordic countries, they're, there are people who are doing good, you know, especially yeah. the, the, the better the company went, the more we worked with top management in these huge companies. Uh, and I realized that th there is a lot of challenges in our society due to educations like that not reaching more broadly and working with people. You make the biggest difference maybe with people who had never had a leadership training. Mm -hmm. uh, and here we worked with top 300 at Ericsson who had a lot of days invested in them already. And we 
supposed to give them even more uh, of that. Yeah. Which is good and important, but uh, I, I wanted to see if we can work in a different way. Uh, so the second startup that is Relate uh, looked at, can we use personal development or human development as a Trojan horse uh, mm -hmm. into regular people's lives, into their relationships, uh, mm -hmm. and into actually when people are the, we started off with a dating app we said okay you're single you want to find love it's a very <laughs> strong yeah. motivation it's mm -hmm. uh it's something that you truly feel oh my god I want to share my life with somebody I'm going to sleep alone and I want to have somebody next to me I want to share my life and then we said okay but then you should clarify who you are and what you want because all the science shows that if you share many values there is a bigger chance that you will uh, create a relationship that will be lasting over time. Mm. There's so much science uh, pointing towards that direction. And for that, you need to know your own values. So there, then there is a motivation to start working with yourself. And especially also in the dating world, most people in the apps are avoidantly attached. So they are they want closeness, but they get afraid of when they get too much of it. So they do yeah. loops back uh, mm into the dating apps all the time. So we said, wait, then maybe you should work a little bit with attachment and understanding if you're a bit avoidant and have a hard, a hard time with getting close or if you're throwing yourself way too much in there and a bit <laughs> anxious, ambivalent yeah. in the attachment, then you, you would need to heal that. So start helping people both on individual level, but then also we started an app for couples to better their relationships, even if you're not single, but you want to develop in your relationships so you can do that with similar ways i mean how we relate to differences i mean from the values research i learned that there are a few hundred values that are human that people can think differently about and we choose about 20 of them 20 to 30 that we have in our everyday life and mm. there is no way you will find a person who is identical and share all of your interests, all of your values. So there is always mm. going to be differences in these tensions. Mm. And a very interesting thing, even if we take the smallest uh, system, I mean, not the smallest system, but the smallest human system consisting of two people trying to yeah. have some kind of relationship, there will be tensions and there will be differences and how we relate to them are key to both our own well-being, but also the other person and the relationship in between. Yeah. So, so there is a lot of work where we can do on that smallest level. And it's it, it, we're still working with that. We're working with a lot of thought leaders and psychologists and doing podcasts and so on on, on, on relationships and how you can improve both yourself and in your romantic relationships. So that's Relate uh, for, yeah. for a few years. Um, which uh, has beautiful group of people behind it. It's all values driven investors who have done, I mean, people like who, who started the Good Cause uh, Foundation, the Eckhart Foundation, but also the H&M uh, founder or chair, ex-chairman called Johan mm -hmm. Pashon and others who want to create a new era of dating apps or digital tools that can actually make a difference in society also. So people who are trying to give back to society. Uh, so we have a dream team of investors. We have a beautiful team working on this. But even there, it's, it's still, it's nudging. It's nudging people both in leadership mm. and in relationships. So the inner development goals were where I'm 80% of my time now. Uh, what, what we're doing is we're, we're asking ourselves, how can we push the whole system? of yeah. values and perspectives in society and not, on, not only society in the Nordics, but globally to understand that personal development, leadership development, inner growth is not something, some luxury thing that you can put on top once everything else is sorted. It's not a hobby. Yeah. It's something that is necessary for us to keep democracies, uh, to to, have, to be able to reach the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals and for us to have a flourishing uh, world and society, we yeah. really need to work with human development on all levels and throughout the whole lifespan. Yeah. And if, if we don't do that, there is a real existential danger. And a lot of it we are seeing today with the polarization, with people not being able to speak or relate or understand each other. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so we are asking ourselves the question, how can we uh, use some of the insights maybe from how other movements mm -hmm. like the equality movement has in some ways succeeded in countries like Sweden, mm. where it's a very strong norm if you're a manager or a person in power, especially, mm. that you need to care about this and work with this systemically. And you, the least thing you have to do is pay it lip service because you're going to be thrown out of the boardroom or leadership team. Yeah. Uh, and how can we make the same thing with leadership development or personal development? Because today, senior leaders still can say, oh, that's up to you. You, 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 you mind that with your own psychologist or your own, that this is nothing yeah. that we are responsible yeah. for doing. Like this, yeah. the business of business is business, you know? And <laughs> yeah, so you, 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 you've said a lot and um, it's so incredibly rich. And I just want to take you back to a couple of questions within what you've thrown up. And, and one of them would be exactly the last point that you got to there. Because if you if we're trying to work systemically so that, you know, if we're now thinking about, well, you, you know, the sustainable development goals, for example, um, and then you're mentioning how so many leaders of the current system that we're in, you know, are in that mindset still, you know, business is business, you know, money is money, uh, you know, this is what's real. Um, how much do you feel that that is coloring the whole system? You know, what power does that still have over the whole system? Um, where do you feel you can make your most successful intervention in terms of changing the whole system? I mean, systems change gradually, then suddenly, you know, just like you go mm. bankrupt first <laughs> gradually, <laughs> then suddenly. Yeah. <laughs> so uh so i do think it's a it's a progression and yes of course we live in a world where most of us or the mm. people are still looking outwards and there is its status and it it's power games and it's money and it's it's a lot of the things that we know not necessarily makes us happy but that's what's what is visible what is talked about and what's running the show mm. we behind the project also strongly believe that these inner parts, both individual and collective, are truly important and they are overseen. So, I mean, I think we need to give some frame to the listeners who don't know what the inner development goals are. I mean, just, yeah. just like we have the sustainable development goals that has been co-created globally mm. uh, and there are the world does not consist of 17 problems or boxes, but we all recognize the logo and it's a very effective communication language for us to get engaged into big global issues. What many people don't know is that it's a Swedish designer and communication bureau that has been working with helping UN to, to put this into practice and have created that, those beautiful symbols and so on. And the people behind it have of course also been very frustrated seeing like, okay, this has most people in, in power in the world now know about the sustainable development goals. Many companies and organizations use it, but we're still not making progress. We're still even going against those goals in many, many areas. Mm -hmm. So the question was what inner shifts are needed for us if it's us, the people who are in the way? What are the inner shifts and the inner development goals that we need to develop or be different in what way do we need to be different in order to achieve the sustainable development goals so we have together with researchers from harvard mit karlinska institute stockholm school of economics thousand plus people co-created this first draft of the framework that shows and communicates 23 skills divided into five categories of being thinking relating collaborating and acting mm. what skills are needed and i mean just by having a simple model like that or framework and pointing to these five dimensions of human development and saying this is really needed and we need to work on that i think we can get more people engaged because the scientists have just like earlier on in the sustainability movement and the equality movement been using different words different language and it doesn't become as powerful 
as if we all come together and say, here are some of the dimensions, here is, this is not exactly how it works, but it, this is how we can make sense of the inner complexities. Right. Just So, and by, by communicating that and popularizing basically the understanding that human development matters and that it's also us who need to change, mm. we think we can contribute to a movement globally where of course progressive organizations and some governments like Costa Rica being the first government signing uh, documents that they will be working with inner development goals in all of their public sector. We have other countries like Rwanda, who's been through very hard times, of course, and, and some progressive countries who are wanting to stay progressive um, in areas around sustainability who are looking at implementing and working with that. So this, this is where I think we can make the difference. The, the biggest difference I think is hard to know where and how, but through pointing to a blind spot and helping people who already are addressing this blind spot to have a language and a framework that is easy, more easy to communicate with mm. and have an impact globally. So my first question would be, you know, um, because I really like I like the narrative and I like the shift and I and I totally make sense for me, you know, that there should be inner development goals. But when I'm thinking historically, you know, what were the inner development goals, or have there ever been inner development goals before? You know, I'm I'm pushed to ask the question, you know, what is the role of culture and what is the role of religion? Because in a sense, people have always had an inner life, you know, but we haven't. We've shared that inner life in a completely different format than the way that you're describing, and it has had a completely different impact than the one that we're looking for right now. So can you, it's a huge, you know, trying to bring these two narratives into one space, but can, can you attempt to, to make a relationship between these two ideas of what the inner is? I mean, there is a movement, if you look at the Eagle Health Welzer World Value Survey that looks at how people's values globally develop, there is a movement away from the traditional and religious values towards more uh, secular and also more focused on self-expression rather than tradition. And there, of course, we gain more freedom, mm. but we also lose guidance. Mm. Uh, from traditions or tradition or some religious values and of course dogma that is very healthy sometimes mm. for us to release but it also becomes very postmodern, modern very, very scattered and it creates a lot of anxiety for people how am I to lead my life and what is meaningful and I mean the answer our society has been giving us is like yeah, but you just go and maximize your own happiness. Like as long as you're, you're happy, you know, everything will be fine. Mm -hmm. um, and the market economy, you, you do what you want as long as you're not hurting anybody. But these answers turn out to not be very integral or holistic in a sense, because there is a lot of costs that we're paying for trying globally to have more, more or less consciously this philosophicals answers given to us uh, and more and more people start to see that wait the way we're acting collectively is not sustainable for the environment it's not sustainable socially maybe we have a lot of social divides coming up from this and and the question then is okay and do we want to consciously reflect as humans mm -hmm. how do we want to develop our culture globally and how do we want to develop as humans together? Because of course we can just let say that, no, we should just let evolution handle that and it will all be fine. But if we look into our organizations, I mean, all organizations, or at least the ones who are successful are quite keen on being clear on their values and their leadership principles and how they want to live consciously. And of course they fail in many ways and there is all these gaps in between, but, uh, most of the successful organizations I've been to and working with during my years have been quite aware of those aspects. And the question is, why aren't we doing this globally then? Why aren't we, uh, if we have sustainable development goals 
and we realize that we have some external goals. I mean, just like, like a company can have goals of markets they want to be in or shares or profit they want to make. Uh, if we have these external goals together globally, why aren't we doing our culture work together? Why aren't we reflecting and understanding that if we are conscious and deliberate on the skills that we want to grow and where, what kind of society and what kind of humans mm. we want mm. to create and what kind of leaders we want mm. for our top positions. Mm. I mean, and the more deliberate, and of course, this is a dialogue. We're never going to be done and say, this is the answer. The inner development goals is not the answer. No, no, absolutely, it, absolutely. It, 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 it's just the starting point of a global dialogue yeah. where more and more countries and big organizations get involved and we start talking about these very important issues. But can I, can I press you a little bit further? Because I, I'm so um, fascinated by the trajectory. You know, what is, our, what, is our, what is our journey with this? And where can we get to between now and 2030, for example? So the big questions that come up politically in that space would be, so what do you think China's view of that would be? Or what would India's view of that be? And what I, what I mean by that is, you know, in their cultures or in their relationship between the individual and the state, for example, there is already a very different um, internal spiritual understanding of the relationship between the self and the society that you might say, according to what you're describing here, and I might say myself, I am Indonesian, I come from that part of the world, that they might be ahead of us in that sense and that there's something to learn and in fact spiritual fashion if you like has moved very much towards the east um, and we are searching and learning more than we are teaching uh, and have been doing that maybe since the 60s so how do you integrate that kind of knowledge into what I'm hearing is a very important development at the you know at the governance level you know the the power levels you know of our global of our global um, institutions it's a very big and complex question and mm. there are several I, I'll try to speak to a few aspects of it at least mm. I mean first of all uh, in the west we have a very biased way of viewing also development Mm. Development is put much more on individuals. And when we say inner development goals, we think about individual development. Mm. Whereas in the East, there is much more understanding, what I know at least, of the interconnectivity. Uh, mm. And uh, inner also means collective in, in a much broader sense. Yeah. Uh, so, so yes, there is a lot, a lot of more wisdom there. Um, and, I, and I do think we have a lot to learn uh, from these countries. We, we are doing our first uh, Inner Development Goals global program where we are inviting. I, I hope that uh, India will be one of the five countries mm. that will be piloting and giving input on both the framework and the methods and so on. So there is, yeah, fantastic, it's yeah. very much an open uh, learning system. Uh, there is also, I mean, the way of working with this, to be honest, the Inner Development Goals, it's almost I think like the world is having a headache or like some symptoms because of the Western mind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we have all these sustainability, I mean, of the linear thinking of the very masculine Western colonized way of approaching the world, distracting from it. Uh, and in some sense, the inner development goals. I mean, come on, who talks about goals when it comes to inner development? It's silly. Just no, I, I, love, I love that you expressing that, yeah, because sometimes no, I mean, there are moments when I'm wondering that, yeah. No, but, but, but I mean, it, we are packaging the framework in a Western package deliberately because it's, it's a cure for the Western mind by the Western mind, <laughs> or, maybe, but... But also it's interesting how, because we are also the problem. It's, it's not the people in the East with much more complex understanding mm. who are causing the troubles. It, it's this Western capitalistic systems mm. that we have invented. And maybe it's like a Trojan horse here again, where we, 
need to start with something that is very paradoxical. I mean, mm. inner development goals, but people mm. get it instantly, yeah. especially Westerners. Yeah. And when we invite other governments to co-create, this will develop and transform into something else. Yeah. But where we are today, I do think it has a point to be presented if we talk about spiral dynamics in a very orange costume very yes. much uh, let's make this efficiently let's uh, if we are to reach the sustainable development goals yeah. we have a blind spot and we need to address it and we call it the inner development yeah. goals. and everybody knows who are into complexity this is not how it works but in the world where we live today integral theory metamodern philosophy that i've been passionate about for years does not make a big bang. And I think the inner development goals is, is that step that can, can get people interested and get them into more complex frameworks, theories, ways of thinking, and yeah. could be something that opened doors for this. Yeah. And of yeah. course, we need to be really, really careful how we, once we consciously reduce this complexity to, to this framework or to this yeah five dimensions and inner development goals and programs and everything that we're doing mm. to make sure that we're not losing ourselves or our soul or that pure mm. aliveness and complexity in it. Mm. And this is something that I'm struggling with. And it's, it's hard, as I'm saying, it's really yeah. hard every day. <laughs> But there is something in making it simple, understandable for many people, conservatives as progressives. Yes. And if we are to lean somewhere, I think we really need to lean to get the people that we usually leave behind, like the conservatives, uh, mm. like the ones who do think that this is new age, fluffy stuff. Mm. And, and how do we speak about inner development to those who are skeptical, mm. rather to those who are already loving it and are metamodern thinkers and philosophers. Mm. Mm. So I'm just going to let that settle for a moment because I think you did convey so very much of of, of the difficulty, but also I, can, I just can feel the passion for it so strongly. And it's very um, encouraging, you know, when you as a as a as a white man in Sweden, you know, right at the heart of the, in, you know, the institutions that hold the power, that you're willing to say, you know, that it's not easy. It's not, but but it's also because I mean, and I I wasn't born with this insights. Mm. I've been, I've been trying to listen, and I said I grew up trying to listen to different family members and make sense. And in this initiative, many of the things I said a year ago, I wouldn't be able to formulate them if I hadn't a very beautiful and diverse team who has been challenging me and having yeah. conflicts yeah. with me around these questions in order to help me grow and help me see my blind spots. Yeah. And I'm sure that I will never be able to eradicate them all. And I think we will all have a lot of blind spots, but we can grow in our understanding and in our integral or system mm -hmm. thinking. Mm. And I do think that we can help people to, to see that it's, it's possible to, through interventions, through help from our culture, from each other, mm. from people with uh, scientific training, with, with good methods, that we can grow in our ways to relate to other people and relate to other ideas that we find different or hard to hold, just like we can grow yeah. in our relationships we can grow in how we make politics, in yeah. how we uh, work with both organizational structures and policies that we create within our nations or world, worldwide. Yeah. So this is a, li a very live project, it seems to me. Um, and I'm going to invite you to address something which, uh, you, you know, is a, is a, is a common problem, you know, when introducing integral theory to people. Um, and I wonder if you have a shortcut, you know, to seeing how we overcome this problem, which is, you know, the perception of this kind of developmental work as being hierarchical, you know, on a ladder that's, that, that we, the people who are trying to bring this, might perceive ourselves as somewhere high on this ladder 
and anybody that we're talking to, we're inviting them to think of themselves as lower on the ladder and maybe needing to develop. How, do we, how in your experience can we, even visually, or in terms of the media, or in terms of narratives, how do we get over this? Because I can certainly see that that's not where your passion lies. Your passion is, you know, is, is fed by the fact that you listen and you reflect and you're hearing and that you're being led by um, the people around you who are showing you your blind spot. This is not a sort of arrogant perspective of, I'm bringing you the ladder, please get on it, right? Mm -hmm which is the old way of doing things in terms of uh, a career, for example, or progress itself being presented as a ladder. How do, how, how, do you have any shortcuts or any you know, ways to get over that perception? The honest answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> if right. I did, uh, yeah. that would be beautiful. Uh, I, I think it's, it's like always both and, I guess. Mm. Uh, and I do think that stage theories in general and integral theory has a value. Mm. Uh, and I do think that it can blind us and uh, it can be weaponized and even be dangerous. Mm. And this is why I'm very passionate about models that are doing the same thing, but that does not need to get into these types of problems where we're talking about a broad development of skills. Mm. What I how I, I've been working closely with Robert Keegan. I had the privilege of spending many educational days and master classes with him, both in Sweden and online during COVID. Um, and it's beautiful to see how, when he works with teams that most of the time, he does not mention the stage theory. He just does the work and then conveys that, you know, some of the shifts that happen in us adults happen when we're around 30 or 40 and there are some big shifts that can happen then when we truly mm. grow up and show up yeah. in our full power and mm. leadership and some shifts actually seem not to be possible until we reach the age of 50 or 60 mm. and I mean we can have tastes of those perspectives of more wisdom or transformational thinking but as Bob says he says I'm, I'm sure there are people who are younger who are integrated at those stages, but I've just never met any of them or being able mm. to measure uh, mm. them in, in their subject object interviews or so. It's just something that usually happens when you're 50 or 60. And, and I'm, I'm just in my 40s. So there are, I'm humble that there are many things that I yet don't see and won't mm. be able to see or grasp mm. fully for another 10 or 20, maybe even 30 years. Mm. And, and I think that that humility from a societal perspective is really important to understand how do we work with people throughout the whole lifespan. But but can I can I ask back to you because you know my own experience is that both things are possible, right? So it's true to hold that humility and to wait and be patient. You know that things uh, may develop later. And one of the things I love about Kagan's vision is this idea that we're living longer and older because this is the era of really harvesting wisdom. Uh, and it could be that that's exactly, you know, historically we'll look back and say this was so right, you know. But there's another aspect to it, which is something that I experienced a lot myself when you go really outside of the privileged circles that we move in to the more difficult struggle, you know, materially struggling places that people develop earlier, in yeah. fact, because they have to. And so I spent two years, for example, with social workers working in quite deprived areas uh, of Scotland and was constantly, you know, knocked back by their ability to integrate complex realities for people whose lives were really on the brink all the time. Mm. And that they had to do that. And that their ability to oversee a human being as a system, for example, was they had no choice. If they, if they weren't able to do that, that person would die. Mm. You know, so they had to develop responses and methods of management to save literally whole sectors of communities mm. and so on. And so, you know, my question is, do we think enough ourselves 
about where the wisdom might lie, where resilience has really been forged ahead of us, the privileged people who, you know, have had a relatively relaxed time because that urgency has only now come upon us, you know, because now we see that we've been destroying the planet. Now we see the social injustice that we gave rise to through our privileged action. So I wonder if that appears anywhere in your, um, you know, methods of learning to go to places where people have struggled and developed maybe capacities that we don't easily recognize. No, I, I think this is a huge topic, and this is why I say both and, and I spoke to one of it about the stage theories and integral theory, and there are many shadows there. And then from the other side, dear friend and colleague, Bonita Roy, she has a mm. beautiful model that is much more organic, systemic. And some philosophers even say that the way we make sense of the world radically changed when the internet came about and the people who grew up with the internet and how they sure. apply that and integrate that. And of course, as you say, also some groups, you can see this even in, in, in the stage theory. If, you, if you're in a very dysfunctional culture, it can be some type, but you have some support, it can be a strength because you more easily understand, wait, this is strange norms. I need to find my own compass yeah. here. I, I don't want to be in this. Uh, so this can help people mature much earlier. And mm -hmm. I'm also sure that we will have new developmental models coming mm -hmm. as we are facing global challenges. Mm -hmm. the, the youth, the Gretas of the world, yeah. uh, I'm sure in, in some ways they're much more mature than we are. Um, so yes, there is a lot of learning to be done. Mm -hmm. But the, the challenge when you ask towards 2030 it's also thinking about the people in power. Yes. The people with this very linear, many times Western bias. Mm. And sometimes it's, it's almost, there are, there are different things we need in different time horizons. Mm. And I think the inner development goals can contribute in the very short time horizon of helping some of them to be able to embrace some of the policies, some of the investments or prioritizations needed mm. or the other people who are doing their work on other levels to give them an arena and a place to bring their gifts and theories and, and ways of working. Mm. So sometimes uh, we had with Nora Bates and I hope we're going to meet soon and, and talk and maybe even have a Zoom like this either with myself or Christian Stolner Sometimes we collide in worldviews or ways of seeing it, but of course, it's all there, there is different values in different perspectives, and sometimes they can be valuable in different time perspectives also. Mm. Uh, so being aware of that is, I guess, another part of be trying to be integral in one's thinking. Mm. So you mentioned just the last few minutes, you know, Benita Roy and Nora Bates, and and I, and I wonder if. Again, I'm giving you the hard questions, Jan, you know, <laughs> where you think a more feminine perspective is also playing out at this time. Um, you mentioned right at the beginning that you thought of Stockholm as, or, or, or Sweden as, a, as quite a feminine led um, culture, which is, you know, in, in itself very fascinating. Um, how, how do you feel historically? Is that something that is also on the rise and does it play a distinct part in our ability to develop the way you're describing? I mean, first of all, that just like naming it masculine and feminine is problematic and we all understand that because yeah, it's sure. much more, much, but, but Gert Hofstadter, one of the mm -hmm. cultural researchers for many years had that uh, in his uh, cultural scale with six dimensions, I think, or so. And I think Sweden is one of the countries that, it, or maybe the most feminine country in the world. We're quite yeah. soft, we're conflict avoidant, we are caring, we are maybe more okay with ambiguity uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. And of course, Soviet Union um, and some other countries with a macho culture is much mm -hmm. more traditionally masculine. And this doesn't have to do with men or females. There can, we can have these qualities 
no matter yeah. our, our gender, of course. Uh, and of course, I, I don't know if you've seen the movie about Chernobyl, but uh, like yeah. the, this is the leadership that I grew up with. Like I went to Soviet school. It, it's like the worst mm. toxic mm. masculine mm. ways of being that is creating a lot of the trouble that we see today. And I, I do think there is a lot in bringing the feminine mm. back. A, a lot of my work, I mean, with Relate and Self Leaders has been feminine led leadership principles. Of course, I struggle with myself and with the traumas and heritage and cultural perspectives that I still carry from mm. my parents, grandparents, uh, and mm. so on with the heroic view on leadership and what that is or should mm. be. Mm. Uh, and of course, there is always balances and there is also toxic femininity that yeah. can be and reactive towards the many years of toxic masculinity that we had. So, so we need mm. to be careful not to overdo it. But I think that the coming, I hope, decades, we will have a lot more of that uh, feminine leadership and feminine values if we choose to, to say it that way, even though I know it can be sensitive. Yeah, and we are always tripping over our own language um, and giving rise to something new. But, but thank you very much for that. It's a very sane way of describing the apparent conflict. Um, so thank you for that. So just as a closing question, and I, 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 I do want to thank you for this. It's been very um, comprehensive, you know, and, and it's helpful to see it personified in your, in your own journey. So from a personal level, you know, I know you started out describing how difficult it is. But can you sketch out, you know, for, for us to understand your perspective, what looks like a really good development over the next few years between now and 2030? Can you picture how we might be, you know, in the next eight, seven, eight years? What could happen? I mean, from, from where I am now with the inner development goals, and again, we have co-creation at its heart. I'm one of a thousand people who are contributing with my visions and my mm. perspectives. Mm. And we're having these partner gatherings where we have top academic institutions and huge organizations like uh, IKEA and Google contributing. We have people with much more wisdom and more complexity awareness that are feeding into this. So what you're hearing now is a very small fraction uh, from, from my perspective. But we, we do talk about having nations who take this seriously uh, and who follow some of the prototypes of bigger organizations who mm. have shown that there are benefits in working with the framework and methods of human development and making it a priority. Mm. And we're hoping that the next few years, a few nations really even maybe have a minister in charge of lifelong learning and there mm -hmm. is a ministry and there are science and policies being made. And then these countries collaborate and learn from each other. How can we work on that? Uh, that and even more facilitate for more organizations, for more businesses to take this on and work with this. And I think we need a diversity of cultures and countries into this. This is why we're the first prototype we're doing now, uh, thanks to the donation is with 12 countries where we're taking in applicants from public sector, from the NGOs, from private sector. And we're gonna have five countries who we're gonna, some of the representatives we're gonna gather in Kigali already in November this year to kick this off. And then I don't think anybody knows how that journey towards 2030 looks like, but we're gonna mm. prototype together and learn from each other, mm. from both policies and methods and practices. And I'm quite sure that the framework will need to be updated and adjusted and changed. And I'm quite sure that the methods and the tools will do the same. And I think there is a lot of learning that can happen from different values and cultures, West to East, uh, and north to south, feminine to masculine, and all these dimensions, mm. going back to integral thinking and saying, how can we try to be both and? And I'm sure that we're going to 
fail and we're going to get critique and we're going <laughs> to learn. Uh, but I'm also sure that we will have good fun and that there will be some progress uh, and some successes that others can continue and learn from and develop. And that's the evolutionary process that, that I'm hoping for. Well, thank you so much. And um, you've left me feeling on quite a high, feeling that your vision is very po possible um, and your determination is there. And so thank you very much, Jan, for your work uh, and everything that you're doing. And uh, we'll be watching. <laughs> Please don't watch, Indra. Please join and co-create with well, us. Well, as you know, as you know, I'm absolutely taking part. I'm absolutely yes. taking part. Yes. And that would be for another conversation. And uh, but for the meantime. The yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, what, what you're doing with the politics and with the power and involving people uh, from all layers is so important. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy. And as you know, like Michael Varnstedt, who is working very closely with me, has been involved in the lift project for many years so I, yeah. I think there is a lot where we can co-create and, and learn from each other also yeah we'll be doing that all right thanks very much Jan. Thank okay you.